Hello, and welcome back to We're Not So Different, a podcast about how we are unlocking this bonus Patreon episode for the holiday week. My name is Luke Waters, and I am the co-host and producer of this here Medieval History Podcast. And yeah, um, we weren't going to do an episode this week because of the holidays and everything like that, uh, but a new episode. But we did want to get something out for you guys, and hey, we decided to uh, turn it into kind of an advertisement for the Patreon. So yeah, uh, this is the, the the episode that we're unlocking is a bonus patron-exclusive episode we released in March. It is the first episode in our book club, our seven-part book club series on Dante's Inferno, which you can check out in full if you subscribe to the Patreon. As you have almost certainly heard from listening to the podcast, our Patreon is available for just $5 a month. Uh, yeah, you can go to patreon.com slash WNSDpod, check out, uh, what we have and subscribe if you like, you know, we get, uh, all of, you know, just real quick, we get all of the regular episodes ad free. So you don't have to listen to the ads if you don't want to. And, you know, if you're going back and binging old episodes, that's probably helpful because who wants to hear that shit? Um, you also get, uh, two bonus episodes every month. Um, you know, and those cover everything from our book club series to pop culture culture stuff to like current events episodes things like that stuff that we don't usually cover on the main show that much though there is you know some medieval history there's you know obviously medieval history stuff and medievalism stuff in there too um you also get access to our discord chat where you can talk with other listeners and uh yeah talk to us and we will you know show us your pets show us your memes complain about work you know whatever you want to do it's all good you know and uh all and then of course you know get to ask us questions that we answer at the beginning of podcast episodes um you know and those are just some of the little things we like to give our patrons you know for five dollars a month we just try to uh try to give you as much as we can and uh you know just just give you something that you'll really be able to enjoy aside from enjoying the fact that uh you know in your heart that you are supporting our podcast and we love you for that uh yeah but seriously you know we just want to um you know we just want to talk about uh the patreon we are you know we're about 430 subscribers right now we we would love to push to 500 this year um you know, last year we did uh, 22 bonus episodes in total, um, and that included uh, ending our book club series on the Silmarillion, the entire Dante's Inferno series, uh, the start of our uh, series on uh, Andor, and then, you know, we did two episodes on Castlevania Nocturne, and, uh, you know, other stuff along in there as well. We did a Game of Thrones slash Wars of the Roses episode, uh talked a little bit about how the biblical canon was built out, everything like that. You know, it was a lot of fun, um, and we really love doing it, and we hope that uh, this year you'll uh, subscribe and uh, and check it out, and that you'll, you know, you'll hear it, and you'll love, uh, you'll love it just as much as we do. Um, you know, so yeah, that, uh, that's what we got going on. Um, you can check out our new collections, uh, on the Patreon, which is just, you know, collections of our book club, um, TV club and, uh, and, and, you know, current events type episodes, stuff like that. We're also going to have, uh, some stuff up in the shop as well. If I guess if you don't want to subscribe, but you want to, uh, buy access to, you know, just one of the book clubs here or the other, you'll be able to do that for just a one-time fee. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you go to our Patreon, you can check that out. It'll, uh, be, you know, anywhere from like eight to, uh, to $10, but you know, that, uh, that's a lot of fun. And we would, uh, you know, if you don't want to subscribe to the whole thing, I guess you can do this, but, uh, but yeah, enough of me talking uh we love we love uh doing the show we we love doing the bonus episodes we love you know our patrons and everything like that so you know if you like the show if you want to help us keep going in the future and everything please do subscribe we would really appreciate it it would help us out a lot and yeah it really does uh keep the show going because uh it's the thing i do in addition to all of the domestic housework and it's uh one of the way eleanor keeps the lights on for herself as well uh yeah so from both of us 
Happy holidays. Thank you so much for listening in 2023. We hope uh, you'll continue in 2024 and you'll enjoy this. Uh, There's going to be a brief uh, delay and then in just a second you will hear uh, me and Eleanor doing a brief cold open and then uh, doing an introduction to our book club series on Dante's Inferno. So if you like this, you like Dante's Inferno, you like the Silmarillion, you like any of the other pop culture-y type shit that we do, then please, by all means, do subscribe. Patreon.com slash WNSDpod. Anyway, thanks so much, guys. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you in 2024. Getting ready to fucking jam about Dante. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. Living the dream. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you... How do you say his last name? Is it Allegari? Allegari. Allegari, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're on it. All right. Alligator. Alligator. Hey. 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 It helps if you do the, the yeah. thing with your hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> learning, learning. I'm teaching myself stereotypical Italian. Yeah, absolutely. Just, well, it, it's fine. You can be, you can be racist towards Italians. It's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. They're not a race. Mm-hmm. They're just. They are not. They're just some guys. So, you <laughs> There's know. There's some guys who talk the same. Yeah. Kinda. 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 Share the boot of a country share the boot of a continent the same (laughs) well it's so funny kind of like um you know so i went back and did obviously some reading about dante again and it's hilarious because of the way like the fascists picked up on him right Mm. yeah 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 and the fascists are all like oh yeah he's like a symbol of italianness and i'm like i mean my man's florentine (laughs) <laughs> right like it, it's just it's just kind of like so funny because it's just sort of like i don't know like i would he have thought he had a whole lot in common with sicilians at the time i just don't feel like he would but my okay. ma- my man my man was obsessed with one thing and that was city states yeah he didn't give a shit about that it, you're you know you're florentine you're mantuan you're no uh you're uh you know like whatever i don't fucking remember all of them he went know? he went to venice and immediately died you know like yeah. i just feel like that's not yeah. what's going down you know what i mean <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah that's it's yeah it's really funny how the how like every like italian group is like nope take, gotta take uh gotta take credit for this guy and they're like this is like the greatest one ever and it's like i mean i, I cool but like if if this means if that means Italian to you, then like surely Julius Caesar was Italian. Surely Augustus was Italian. Like I mean, yeah, they, they I, literally ruled from Rome. Like I mean, yeah, like what, that. Like where are we drawing lines here? That's yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. No, you're totally right because it's like, it, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's probably better to choose a poet. Mm-hmm. Than than an emperor, I think that's probably better. But yeah, but I it, doubt the fascist had that like yeah. <laughs> intent. <laughs> yeah, oh, completely. And, and I guess it's just really funny to to, uh, but you know, like this is so the thing in the nineteenth and twentieth century is like go find a medieval guy, mm. and then explain why it is that he particularly is like proof that your nation state exists. Yeah. It's like, you know, like this is kind of like the thing. But I just think it's so fucking funny to do it, like, to this guy who's just ex- obsessed with being Florentine to, mm-hmm. like, the exception of literally anything else. Yeah. Like, he don't care about any other shit, yeah. you know? His, his life his life was over after they exiled him. Like, mm-hmm. it, like, mm-hmm. I, it, like it is... I, I said it the other... I said it the yesterday. I've never loved i have a child and i've never loved anything as much as this guy loves, <laughs> loves that fucking Florence. town oh man like yeah like i mean i like i mean i i i assume exile could be very hard if you like didn't want to be exiled and you lost like a power struggle where you got stabbed in the back by your own allies but at the same time like but I kind of also feel like, you know, there is, so some of it is missing Florence, but some of it is just kind of this desire to, like, not be proved wrong. Mm-hmm. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Oh, yeah. Because, like, yeah. there's this there's this whole lot in there where it's like, well, he just won't, like, he if you love Florence that much, you could suck it up. That's That would be yeah. my argument. That's my argument. <laughs> yeah. He's, I just, man... I, like you know the the medieval brain very similar in some ways some things no clue man yeah no, it, no I mean clue. 
<laughs> I guess that it's like um, ideas of honor we don't have in the same yeah. way a- anymore. Yeah. I mean, like maybe, kind of, but just like, you know, it's like he's going pretty samurai with that one. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, there were plenty of people who got exiled. I don't. They all didn't. Uh, they all didn't make such a meal out of it as this guy. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, Florence! Oh, oh so good God, oh. man! All right, well, yeah. Uh, cool. You want to talk about um, yeah. uh, eternal damnation and hellfire and brimstone? Yeah, pretty much always. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's do it. <laughs> all right. Three, two, one. Hello, and welcome back to We're Not So Different, a podcast about how we've always been idiots. Uh, This is your bonus Patreon edition. Mm. Uh, Hello, friends, and we are glad to be here, Uh, glad to talk to you. Before we get going, uh, just a note, Uh, next patron episode will be out next week, probably on, I guess, Friday's the 31st, so probably on the 31st, Um, but... uh, we um for this one we're just going to do uh like a random topic and it's not really going to be uh anything related to the middle ages or medievalism or anything like that uh just you know trying something new and if people like it we'll do some more of it and if they don't well then we'll figure out something else yeah but I mean, uh, you know yeah just, we're just, switch, kind of, just switching it up a little <laughs> and i mean we're going really heavy on the like medieval on mm-hmm. you guys on this one you know it's all well and good to do the silmarillion which is a medieval ism right ism, yeah like this is this is a hardcore but yeah, i mean i say that but it, it whips so it's fine it does yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's really crazy how much i complain about it and then when i read it i'm like god damn this is metal as fuck like it is dude it is it is like reading like have you ever played the video game doom yes it is like i mean like mm. i that's literally like like i i mean i I guarantee you they didn't like use this as their primary source, but like in my mind, like doom is just somebody retelling the inferno, but they were like, Oh, I got to figure out some way to make it a video game. Okay. We'll give them guns. <laughs> and, uh, and Hitler's the devil. And you're like, yeah, man, pretty much. That's pretty much what Dante did. So yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it's good. Yeah. Like that's, that's a really, it's very true to the spirit of Dante. I have that's to say. Right. You yep. Know? Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, Dante's Inferno. So yeah, let's uh, get going. Uh, quote, Through me you enter into the city of woes. Through me you enter into eternal pain. Through me you enter the population of loss. Justice move my high maker in power divine, wisdom supreme, love primal. No things were before me not eternal. Eternal I remain. Abandon all hope, you who enter here. End quote. So reads the inscription writ upon the gates of hell that Dante passes through with the help of his spirit guide Virgil in the third canto of the Inferno. This marks the true beginning of 14th century Italian poet Dante Alighieri's uh, three-part epic poem, The Divine Comedy, wherein Dante himself is guided through all three levels of the Catholic afterlife, Inferno, i.e. hell, Purgatorio, I e. purgatory <laughs> and paradiso. I see. I e. heaven. I'm sorry. I will stop. We, we are I'm doing sure. the hands, everybody. I want you to know that we are straight up doing the hands. I I, I, pro- I promise not to make it too much, but like some of these names, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm really bad. Uh, despite the fact that they were initially published as a single volume, the Divine Comedy, they have since been separated and now widely re- and are now widely regarded as three separate works. So don't blame us because we're not covering Purgatorio and Paradiso. Uh, blame history or culture, someone else for breaking them up, but it certainly wasn't us. <laughs> we're not we're not concerned with topics like redemption Mm-mm. and the glory of living forever with the eternal creator of the universe. We're interested in far darker dealings that take place in the inferno. 
Alighieri's vision of hell is his chaotic magnum opus, at once a literal heartbreaking work of staggering genius that resonates through the ages and has served as one of the bedrocks of the Western canons of literature for over 500 years, whatever Western canons of literature actually means. But at the same time, it is so astoundingly petty and myopically specific to Alighieri's real-life <laughs> grievances that it feels truly dated, a work mired in the grimy, confusing politics of Florence, Italy. Well, actually, just Florence. It was in Italy then, between 1280 <laughs> and 1320, especially the Guelph Ghibelline conflict. And yet, these seemingly antithetical traits combine to make greatness and also make Inferno fascinating from so many perspectives. Historically speaking, it is almost unique, an all too rare glimpse into the mind of a medieval person, and more specifically, how the medieval mind conceptualizes hell, God, the afterlife, and the things of that nature. It is, quite frankly, also a view into a man brooding in exile and how he's so mad, he's so <laughs> mad at his enemies who kicked him out of Florence, he literally writes fanfic damning them to hell, which, I mean, hey, we're really not so different after all, huh? Mm -hmm. In terms of cultural impact, uh, there are only a handful of works that can boast such lasting and durable influence as the Inferno. Regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, the hell you envision in your head when you hear that word has almost certainly been influenced by Dante. The idea of hell is having many circles, the concept of a burning pit where demons inflict ironic punishments, and the trope of the absence of God's love being an icy wasteland are all directly attributed to this work. That is not to say they originated here, they certainly did not, but it is to say that if you've seen that one Treehouse of Horror episode of The Simpsons where Homer briefly goes to hell for eating a forbidden donut... <laughs> You've witnessed the Inferno's ongoing cultural impact firsthand. Uh, the conception of hell is so pervasive that it is even passed down to Protestants as well. And the Protestant view of hell itself is very close to the one Dante laid out, laid out to the great irritation of certain Protestants. We also see Dante's own cultural milieu bubbling up as he references epics and contemporary literature. And we find that his hell is populated not just with nameless demons, but is probably but is positively rife with real figures from cla with figures from classical myth mythology. Dante and Virgil are harassed by the Furies, ferried by the psychopomp Charon, uh, ride upon the back of the monster Geryon, and encounter fictional characters like Mira and Jason of the Argonauts fame, uh, being, tor being tormented eternally in hell. Somehow, Dante's Inferno mills all of these things together into a truly fascinating epic poem that is still interesting, even if you don't really care about all that shit, because it's a truly metal ride through hell, and who could resist that? Mm. So yeah, we're going to discuss the Inferno uh, over the next few months, like we did with the Silmarillion in our last book club, book club series, though we won't go so long with this one, and we'll be switching up the format a little. Things I don't know who half the characters in this <laughs> epic poem are supposed to be. It wouldn't feel right for me to just break down every other canto like we did with the chapters of the Silmarillion without any help. Instead, I'm going to rely on my very own Virgil to help light the path and tell me the difference between all of these goddamn Florentines. I will describe what we're seeing in each part of Hell, and then uh, we will throw it to Eleanor, who can actually help us decipher what it all means. But that will mostly be for future episodes in the series. Uh, we might get to a couple of cantos later, but don't press your luck. Uh, because most of this episode will just be introduction. Talk about Dante the person, the, situate, the situating him in his historical circumstances, that caused him to write the Divine Comedy, um, and uh, as well as the legacy of uh, the poem Inferno itself. And don't worry uh, if, you have, if you're a bit confused by all this talk of circles and hell and stuff. We're going to go through the cosmology and layout of Dante's hell next time. Mm -hmm. Eleanor, in the meantime, Dante Alighieri the guy mm, yeah he's a, he's a guy uh, for he sure is a guy. <laughs> he's definitely a guy um so the thing about dante is that he is like a florentine right so big long big long life where he is born in kind of like the upper echelons of florentine society and he was born, we think, kind of around 1265. Um, but we mostly know this uh, from 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 the Divine Comedy, right? It's it, from the Inferno because in the Inferno he kind of <laughs> yeah. like gives a timeline, and that's how we know it, right? Um, so we think also maybe he's a Gemini <laughs> based on Ooh. some of the stuff that is written in parody. So he's got a line that says, um, "As I revolved around the eternal twins, I saw revealed from hills to river outlets the threshing floor that makes us so ferocious." So it's like you know, 
Mm. He's revolving around the twins. He's, so he's, he's talking about he's talking about astrology. Yeah, Get him. That's right. Get him. Get it. You, you know how it's it, you know this what? this white man. No, I'm just yeah. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> and so um, now, so the thing of it, of it is, um, you have to understand that he he comes from this particularly um, rich, very well connected Florentine family, um, and so he says at per- particular times that they're descended from ancient Romans, but we don't really know that because like he mentions one of his earliest relatives in a parody. So, uh, who is a uh, Caccia Guida della Lessi, who was kind of like probably born around 1100. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, his family are connected to the white Guelphs. And now he- here's the thing, right? So you've got your Guelphs and you've got your Ghibellines, right? <laughs> and the, really easy way of breaking this down is to say that the Guelphs are pro Pope and the Ghibellines are pro Holy Roman empire. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then the issue is that within the Guelphs, this is so much like our monastics. (laughs) Yeah. It's like within the Guelphs and by this time in the 13th century, you have two factions who are the black Guelphs who are like, yes, the Pope. Fuck. Yeah. I simply love the Pope. Can't wait for the Pope to take over Florence. Let's do this right now. And the White Guelphs, which his family is a part of, who are kind of like a secret third other thing. Um, (laughs) And the White Guelphs, their kind of thing is that they are not like full-fledged, yay, Holy Roman Empire like the Ghibellines are. But what they kind of want is for the Pope to win out in this kind of battle, but then to give a lot of power back to Florence, more or less. They want like the, the Pope to kind of like walk back what it is. That mm-hmm. that he kind of like wants to rule and what it would mean in order to rule Florence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you know we think that like he, they're pretty high up in the in the chain for a number of reasons, um, but you know basically there we know like who his mom is um or who's her name is bella and she's probably a member of the abadi family they're really high up mm-hmm. she dies when he's around 10 his dad remarries or maybe he doesn't maybe she's just a con- concubine but he's got a couple of um he's got a couple of uh half siblings um and basically he kind of like grows up in this particularized milieu right so this means that um he ends up kind of like not just like like not just being a nerd right so he Mm -hmm. is classically educated in the ways that medieval people are right so Mm -hmm. he's raised on the classics um he learns to read and write in latin he reads all the kind of nerdy ass shit that you expect him to but when he begins writing his whole fucking thing is that he doesn't write in latin he writes Mm -hmm. in florentine um, and interestingly, it, it's very interesting how this stuff pans out because this being some of the largest kind of epic works that are written down in a vernacular from the time means that they end up sort of establishing what will become Italian mm-hmm. because, you know, like the act of writing it down is like, oh, okay, well, here's the rules. Mm-hmm. And this is very similar to our boy Jan Hus. So, you know, he writes a bunch of stuff down in Czech and then everyone is like, oh, well, these are the rules of Czech grammar. Same kind of deal <laughs> uh, with, with Dante, which is ironic because he's specifically writing in Florentine. Um, but despite that, he was a fancy lad, went to school, you know, Ken knows his Latin, but he just kind of thinks that you should be writing in Italian. And this is going to eventually uh, be like a thing that, for example, Boccaccio wanks on about um or uh your man there uh god why why can't i remember uh, the the guy who is the the poet for the failed attempt at the roman empire writes all these angry letters to charles the fourth ah it's gone anyway um uh. <laughs> your man there i don't know roman ah uh, but yep. uh, uh yeah so uh like the, basically everyone is like oh yeah fuck yeah we're writing in italian now so that that's like one of his really big his big claims to fame is how about writing in in Florentine, right? Mm. Um, but despite the fact that he's a fucking nerd, he's also really super, super involved in, uh, like, politics, right? So mm. um, in particular, one of the things that's kind of important about him is that he actually fights in battles at a point in time. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so he fights with the Guelph Cavalry at uh, the Battle of Campolino in uh, 1289. Um, and it was kind of between the Guelphs and Ghibellines. Um, and like, so like, the, that's interesting, right? So he's willing to kind of put his money where his mouth is in, in a very kind of like real, real sense. Yeah. Which um, make, which make a lot of his claims to being like, oh, I was so, I was so taken with fear. Like, mm-hmm. man, you rode in the cavalry. I don't yeah. know what you're what you're worried about in a in a scary forest. Come on, yeah. let's get it together, man. Look, calm down, brah. Like yep. so. Anyway, the Guelphs win. Nice for Dante. He loves a bit of that. Um, and so, consequently, there's a kind of like reshuffling of Florentine politics at the time. Um, and um, one of the things that they do is they say, you know, it's all well and good to be a fancy pants like Dante, but what are you doing for the city? And one of the things that they say is if you want to take part in public life, um, then what you need to do is join a guild. Um, because like the guilds are kind of like contributing mm. more to the city. So he joins the physicians and apothecaries guild. Um, not particularly sure why. I mean, books are sold in apothecaries at the time. So maybe, hmm. maybe that's part of it, but I, I don't really know. Um, like, and then he kind of embarks on a bit of a political career in Mm -hmm. Florence. Um, so he, for example, is one of the escorts of Charles Martel of Anjou, um, who visits, uh, Florence. Um, he is kind of like, um, he's pretty high up in terms of city politics. He holds a number of offices. He doesn't seem to be particularly good at it. Uh, mm-hmm. but he, he, he basically does, you know, have a lot of varying, uh, varying offices. Right. So that's kind mm-hmm. of cool. Um, so you then like, while he's holding, while he's holding office, there's this kind of like big, uh, split between the white Guelphs and the black Guelphs. Um, and so like first that's just kind of like along family lines and they just aren't getting along, but then they have these ideological differences. And so the, basically the blacks are much more like, you know, popey, right. As I said. Um, so that as a result of this, um, by the time we like all of this is going down, Pope Boniface the eighth wants to like occupy Florence uh right mm-hmm. um and so and he's kind of like hmm, at dante you know because dante is you know very much saying i don't want you know a pope yeah. to, to, to do such a thing right so um in 1301 charles of valois who is like the brother of king philip the fourth of france um was supposed to be visiting the pope because the pope was like well, he's supposed to be visiting Florence because the Pope was like, we need somebody to come in here and be like an interlocutor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the French are kind of trusted to do this because, well, A, they're super, super powerful. And B, it's like Florence is kind of, well, it's not like asking the emperor, right? Mm-hmm. Because to ask the emperor would just be like way too much. So they're like, okay, we'll get a French guy in here. Um, and so he's supposed to be kind of like chilling out the Tuscan region more generally. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyway, the city's government like basically treats him and like all his ambassadors really really badly uh because it's a lot of white guelphs and they're like get the fuck out of here with this shit um and so basically the council's like look the city council's like we're gonna have to send some guys down to rome to just kind of smooth this over because we've kind of done badly here so like we'll, we'll go down and talk to the pope so um they go down and talk to the pope and boniface tells everyone to fuck off except dante right <laughs> um, and so at the same time Charles of Valois then rocks up into Florence with the black Guelphs who like the white Guelphs basically like sent them all out of the city. And so like they're back and they've got a French guy with them. Um, and they absolutely sack the fucking city, kill a lot of their enemies, do all this bad stuff. So, um, they put in a new black Guelph government. Um, and you could, you, I mean, you can understand why the French would be backing up black Guelphs here. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, yeah, let's absolutely back the Pope. We don't want, uh, like we don't want the empire getting any ideas. Right. So, um, basically, they are, like, here is Dante down in Rome, and, like, uh, okay, so he <laughs> is, he's ordered to be exiled for two years, and he has to pay, like, a big fine, right? Um, and the Black Wolves are, like, oh, and by the way, Dante was super corrupt, and he was doing all this, like, financial bad business, um, while he was kind of supposed to be serving as a prior for Florence, which is kind of, like, as high as you could get in the Florentine mm-hmm. government, which is why he got sent down to Rome in the first place, right? Um, 
So anyway, um, he is in Rome until like 1302 because the Pope uh, was like, I suggest you stay here. (laughs) But hilariously, at the same time, the Black Wolves are like, well, since you won't come back, um, like, and, and pay your fine and everything then you've like you're actually just fucking around right so real really caught between a rock and a hard place here yeah like it's it's really fucked up right so anyway dante's like i'm not gonna pay your fine because a i didn't do anything wrong i mean did he do something wrong i don't know but he says he didn't do anything wrong i mean Um, like it seems like they were just trying like they were you know just working out city politics the way they worked them out it's no more wrong than i mean Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, I, I define what wrong is. I don't know, man. Like, we're doing yeah. military coups at this point in time. So, like, whatever, right? Um, so, he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. And also, you took all my stuff, right? Because, like, they seized all his property in Florida, right? And they were like, okay, mm. well, that is it. You you are condemned to perpetual exile, like, exile now, right? Um, and they're yeah. like, and that meant that if he went back to Florence and he didn't pay the fine, then he could have been burned at the stake. Um and h- hilariously, uh, in the course of like of trying to get all these things right, I found out that in 2008, uh, Florence uh, suspended Dante's sentence. Mm-hmm. They were like, he can come back. Yeah, you can come back when you want to, bro. It's fine. So he starts wandering around. Um, He's living kind of like he's in very many people's house guests. He's kind of like uh, doing the thing that I would like to do with my life, which is that he goes and like lives with varying rich people. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like he's he's kind of like the house guest. He's the Cato Kalen. Of you know, <laughs> there's a '90s reference for you, of the of the medieval world. Um, so like he tries various times to back like particularized wealth, white wealth schemes, and but they all fail, and he kind of like bounces around. He ends up spending a lot of time in Verona, uh, but then maybe he lived in Luca for a while, things like this. So he's kind of like bouncing around, and he's like writing. Mm. Um, and so basically one of the things he does because he's not doing politics anymore is he reads up on a lot more philosophy. He reads up on a lot more literature. Um, and this kind of helps deepen his own writings. Right. Um, so basically we know that he's kind of like bouncing around and in 1310 or so the, um, Holy Roman Emperor Henry the seventh of Luxembourg, uh, goes into Italy. Um, he's got like 5,000 troops. And Dante is like, okay, here we fucking go, right? <laughs> and Dante's like, I'm, ab- I'm about to back an emperor for real. <laughs> because he's all like, oh, you're the new Charlemagne. You could like uh, make the Holy Roman Emperor, like the title be more important again. Like, AKA, could you bring it back down to like the, the, the Italian peninsula? That'd be great, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also, could you kill my enemies, the Black Wolves, right? <laughs> So, and if you don't mind, if you have time after you know you become the universal monarch, you know, yeah, that'd be good. It would be nice, yeah. right? You know, just you know your your Charlemagneness, you know, just whenever, you know. Yeah. So, like, basically, he we've got all this correspondence where he's like writing to any monarch who will listen and be like, please destroy the Black <laughs> Guelphs, which is very very funny. Um, and like he's like you know calling God's vengeance down against Florence and you know things like that. Um, and he, this is at this point in time he writes this part- this work uh, De Monarchia, uh, which is like let's have a universal monarchy under Henry Henry the Seventh. Very un Guelph like behavior. Let's just say that. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, you know, and then eventually he he kind of like starts thinking about the Divine Comedy um, and like, but it's a lot bigger than everything else. Um, and so he kind of like goes, goes through all of this stuff. Um, and he's bouncing around, bouncing around. Um, and like eventually a Henry does assault Florence in 1312, the emperor mm-hmm. Henry. Um, and he defeats the black Wells, Right. But Dante's not involved at this point. Like no, no one knows. Like some people are like, oh, well, even though I asked for this, I'm not going to participate in like a foreigner attacking the city. Um, other people are like, actually, the white Guelphs hate him too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, eventually, Henry the Seventh dies. Um, he he gets a fever, which is rather the thing to do when one goes to Italy, uh, and he dies. And in thirteen thirteen, basically, this this means that like Dante's not going to see 
Florence again because like his one hope was that like Henry the Seventh would kind of like get him away in, but everyone hates him mm-hmm. now, so whatever. So he he goes back to Verona, um, and then he kind of like starts writing the the comedy and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. He interestingly becomes like a big a correspondent with you know like he's writing to kings being like please kill the black Guelphs. Um, he also becomes <laughs> like a pen pals with a Dominican Father Nicholas Brunacci who is one of uh, Thomas Aquinas' students, which is really kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and like he eventually kind of like gets well in 1315 Florence was like said that they were, they need to grant an amnesty to everyone um, in mm-hmm. exile uh, and. That includes Dante, right? But for this, you were supposed to go to Florence and do public penance and, again, pay a really big fine. And Dante, again, <laughs> is like, no, I will not do this. Like, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I used to, I've never been wrong. I used to work in a record store. Um, things of this nature. <laughs> so, um, basically, it's like, okay, well... The guy who who ended up taking the city, um, Ugaccione della Fagiulia, <laughs> I'm not yep. making that name alert, name alert, uh, was like, look, well, we're going to commute Dante's death sentence and say that, like, if he comes to Florence, we'll just put him on house arrest, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, like, you need to say that you, you're you not going to, like, enter the town again. And then that way, you know, if I ever see you, I won't have to kill you. And uh, Dante's just like, fuck you. And then Ugaccioni is like, okay, well, this now applies to your sons as well. <laughs> Which is really quite funny. Uh, and it never works out for him. So um, he dies in Ravenna um, in 1318 um, while he's kind of, like, st- being put up by the prince there. Uh, mm-hmm. But he dies because he got malaria in Venice, mm-hmm. which is, again, rather the thing to do. Um, he gets buried in a church in Ravenna. And hilariously, there's kind of like this back and forth now because the Florentines want his bones back. Mm-hmm. And uh, the in Ravenna, they're like, get fucked. <laughs> With these yep. these bones are ours. That's what's up, and like they they built this like absolutely ridiculous kind of over the top nineteenth century uh, tomb for him in Florence that is empty, and like the yeah. over in like uh, over in Ravenna they like are hiding his bones, making sure mm-hmm. that like nobody steals them. They're doing all, and then like maybe the fascists wanted to like find his bones. Mm-hmm. and like do things with it but also there was at a point in time one of the popes got mad at him uh john the 22nd in like 1329 so not that long after he's dead he decides that uh de monarchia is heretical mm-hmm. and he's like i'm gonna find those bones and burn his bones at the stake <laughs> which is very funny uh <laughs> like so it's just like what a what a thing to do you know what a 14th century thing to do it's like don't you have bigger problems like we're just coming through yeah. the great famine and you're 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 focusing on like burning someone's bones at the stake. But anyway, it doesn't happen. So yeah, that's kind of like a very quick pressy of mm-hmm. of him, right? Like uh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he uh <laughs> yeah, he's he's a very interesting person. His uh, particular uh grievances are so specific and funny to me. Yeah. And the fact that they were like, you can come back kind. And he was like, no, <laughs> no. Like, and at one point it was just like, fuck it. Just ha- like, like have this guy invade the city and, and fuck him up. I don't care. And then he like kind of felt bad about it and he didn't do it. And you know, it's just like, it, like a guy dealing with like a situation where he's never going to get like his life's desire to get what he wants. And he's just like, well, I guess I'm going to go insane in exile. And I mean, I suppose that there's, there's also, I should mention here that he's also mad at the Pope pretty much the whole time too, oh, yeah. uh, for the Avignon papacy. Yep. So oh, yeah. yeah, like, cause we're, we are, we're in Avignon papacy, uh, territory here. So like, um, our man, Pope Clement the fifth, mm-hmm. um, he is, you know, mad chilling. I think we can all yeah. agree. Uh, yep. He's absolutely mad chilling from about, uh, I guess, when when it, it, they move open over there, I think 1305. And basically, he is apoplectic about this. And I'm like, homie, you are Florentine. Like, yeah, calm it down. But so he's also <laughs> just like talking mad shit about popes the whole time, too. So it's like you can see why he goes crazy and is kind of like, I really want the Holy Roman Emperor to step in here. Yeah. Because Which is the thing he he fought completely against in the battle of what was it Camp- 
whatever. Yeah, was Campinola. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and he's it's kind of like now at this point in time, he's just completely changed, you know. And it's it's just because you know politics is wild in the 13th yeah. and 14th centuries. What can I say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's the the like <laughs> the cultural back and forth, or the back and forth between like stuff about his bones. You know, is very funny. You know, his bones have been like secreted away a few times into like separate coffins. The coffin <laughs> one, at for one point in the eighteen hundreds, the coffin that had his bones was lost for like fifty five years, and then some guy found it like with a note on top of it that just said Dante Alighieri's bones. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's just like a you, just put like, a post it on working, there. Yeah, you're just working down in the, you know, whatever the <laughs> whatever the the rectory or priory or whatever it is, and you go down there and there's just like a thing like Oh, that's contents, where we put them. Um... One set of one skeleton of like the greatest Catholic poet of the world. <laughs> I love <laughs> like, it. I love it. It's like, okay. And then they dug his bones up during World War II because they didn't want them bombed. But mm-hmm, weirdly, mm-hmm. they dug them up and just moved them to like a garden. Yeah. Like they were like they didn't move them like under another building or something like that. They were like, nope, just throwing them under the uh, under the bell peppers. I guess I don't know if you know <laughs> bell peppers in Italy. I don't care. I'm sure you probably. I think can. you can. Very, you can. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's very. Uh, it's warm. The climate is very good there. Yeah. Um. You know, and and Eleanor mentioned, but like Florence has been like so thirsty to bring this guy back. That, oh like, man. They just. They like uh, they apologized to his family in uh, for exile in uh, 2008 on the 700th anniversary of its occurrence. And in 2021, on the 700th anniversary of his death, Florentines held a symbolic retrial. Uh, what? Dante was posthumously cleared of any and all crimes against the city and his exile was rescinded. So thankfully now... Um, zombie dante can rise from the grave and return from whence he came um <laughs> he's like yeah man they just i love that too love because him. it's like so he's legally right now you know yeah like I, and, and i absolutely love that for him he would have been he would have been very happy for yep, that to happen he, yeah now he can come back in in full honors uh and instead he just went down uh just absolutely shitting on florence and you know what good for him uh mm-hmm. because that kind of spite you know can get you through a lot and good good for him. <laughs> i know just right you know it's like spite, spite is really like spite is a hundred percent his prime motivator oh yeah i would yeah, say that about so yeah. mad He's mad. He's the hate. He's the biggest hater in the fucking world. Hey, hate, 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 yeah. hate. hate. Like. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, and then of course, you know, in addition to the historical context, you've also got uh, the cultural impact. Um, and so, uh, before we talk about it generally, I just wanted to get your perspective as a medievalist. Like, what mm. what is the lasting impact of his work? Like on the study of, of the medieval and, you know, the medieval mindset, I guess. Yeah, I suppose the, the thing the thing about Dante that is so useful to us is that he is really kind of showing you what, you know, the, the, the wall dressings of the medieval imagination are, right? Mm. So he's got, you know, the good, solid classical education that you would absolutely expect of someone of his, you know, stature. Um, mm. And he has got, like, the ability to reference, you know, Virgil and Homer and all of these things. And and in many ways, like, one of the ways to, to look at the divine comedy is it's kind of like a new retelling like in the way that like homeric literature does the odyssey um or the aeneid which you know is what virgil wrote he's kind of doing his own version of this he's doing his own Mm -hmm. epic version uh because you know when when uh virgil does the aeneid he's very um very markedly uh building up from the odyssey you know, and, th- mm-hmm. and things like that. So he's he's making a conscious decision to make a, a new and more updated version of these things, um, and that's kind of what Dante is doing now. So he's like, okay, well, let's let, but we're setting it within the Christian cosmos, and mm-hmm. here's how we're going to anchor these things. So it's really useful to us because it shows us kind of how people square this circle of like being constantly obsessed with thinkers from the the ancient past, but also you know 
they're Christian, they're Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you kind of like bring those things together? And the answer is you just kind of shake them up and go with it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, they just do not care in ways that we kind of think that uh, that they might, right? We people. She says hi. Hello. What's up? <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> That's a, that's a good thing. I love to do that. Yep. Uh, so we, you, you know, this is the thing I get asked about all the time. It's like, oh, well, there's this kind of assumption, you know, about the church cops and how like everything was just always only religious. And it's like, well, actually half of what's going on is classical for medieval people. If what we're talking about is, is how you make their world. And, and people just don't understand how you square that circle. And the answer is like pretty easily. They're just like, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Like, don't matter to me, right? Like, yeah. it's a, it, it's perfectly possible to do these things, you know, much in the way that, like, you know, Greek mythology still really impacts our own imaginations, mm -hmm. you know, even if, if we are, you know, whatever religion is we are now, or secular, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just kind of a, a part of what's in there. So Dante is really useful to us to because he shows that you can be all these things at once, right? Mm -hmm. I sometimes get absolutely wound the fuck up because some cunts will call him Renaissance, and I'm just like, well, then the Renaissance is completely fucking meaningless. I'm like, <laughs> my man was born in the 13th century. Why don't you calm the fuck down mm. real quick? Like, yeah. that's a long-ass Renaissance. Why don't you just, like, chill yeah. it down, okay? Um, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of assuming people go, oh, but he wrote in the vernacular. Well, French people did too, right? And, like, this yeah. is one of his influences was, like, all of the French kind of lyrical and courtly love mm -hmm. poetry. And he's kind of like, oh, well, if French people can do it, why can't we? Yeah. So, you know, like, just calm down about vernacular literature. My God. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have any specific grievances against uh, the Renaissance, but, uh, you know, I do. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm here for it. So, uh, you know, Speaking of all that stuff, how did the Inferno become, uh, you know, one of the classics, you know, one of those just like uh, parts of like the liberal arts education that you just have to encounter? Ah, oh, it's just really fucking good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fucking good. I mean, like, like I mean, that, 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 like, that is genuinely part of it. Um, it, it very much takes the medieval world by storm. Everyone's fucking freaking out. They're like, ah, I love this shit, right? Because, mm -hmm. again, it does that thing. It's like, it's world building, right? So he yeah. built, he builds out this universe that is instantly recognizable, but new at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so people kind of know what all of his references are. They, they know where he's kind of getting these things. But, you, you know, you know, it's like fanfic, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, because it, it's he gets to have all your favorite saints and, you know, oh, all of the all your favorite um, poets and philosophers are there and they're doing things. And, you know, at the same time, it's like, you know, it, it's great. It's the hater patrol. Everybody loves that. They love the drama. Mm -hmm. So it circulates incredibly wildly because uh, widely, sorry, not wildly. It, it also circulates wildly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it circulates really widely, even though it's written in Italian, because everyone is all like, oh, shit. This is this is really exciting, right? And you get translations, mm -hmm. you get all sorts of things um, that that kind of go on. Um, so basically, it it also then catches on with you know the quote unquote Renaissance. So when people start like really wilding out in the 16th century or so, um, and they want uh, like more and more classical things, um, and they are also making this really specific call out where they desire. Uh, to kind of like say Italy is the best, Italy number one, you know, with a big <laughs> foam finger. Um, and, and specifically with Florentine stuff leading the way there, you know, um, they can then go back to this guy and say, oh, look, here's our standard bearer. It, like it's Dante. Mm -hmm. And they can say, look, look at this uh, great um, lineage that we have here. Um, mm -hmm. e even though we kicked him out, <laughs> you know, and, and so yeah. you can say, like, look at this, look, look at all the, the wonderful things that Italy has been producing and shouldn't you be paying attention to it? And aren't we and wouldn't it be better if Italy controlled the whole region of Europe again? Wouldn't that be good? Right. So um, <laughs> on the one hand, you have that in the Renaissance. On the other, um, in the uh, early modern period, Protestants also like this mm -hmm. because they perceive Dante's. Um, criticisms of the Pope to be like anti-papist mm -hmm. which I think is quite funny because I don't I really wouldn't go that far I'm like oh, buddy he was a Guelph he just didn't like he just didn't like some of them yeah like I yeah. mean I, I can I guess like I guess I could see you might could see how you could like trick yourself into that but like he puts a bunch of them in paradise too, man. It's not yeah. like he was like throwing them all out. Like he's just he's just mad at Clement V 
and yeah. he is and he also just didn't want them actually ruling Florence because he wanted to rule Florence right mm-hmm. like it's not it is not that fucking complicated he's right he's taking his ball and he's going home exactly um and then also you know one of the big themes that you see over and over again um in more specifically uh, the inferno um is you do see these big call outs to self guidance in order to evolve to 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 mm. um avoid sin Right. So there, there's this kind of thing about saying, OK, you need to kind of like uh, save yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. You need to find the right way on your own because, you know, you're kind of surrounded by sin. And there is going to have to be a genuine choice that you make mm-hmm. in order to have that happen. And of course, fucking Protestants love this. Right. So Protestants are like, fuck, yeah, that that's my shit. So it he kind of can come at you from both sides mm-hmm. and he really makes it through the early modern period as this guy that everybody wants to claim so the protestants want to claim him because of uh you know like he he, he can go with their own prejudices and the Catholics want him for the same reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And everyone just kind of claims him for his own team. But again, the reason why everybody wants to claim him for their own team is because this shit whips. It goes so hard um, and it's really fun and interesting. And then by the time everyone's still talking about it in the early modern period, then, you know, because of the way that the modern, modern period works, we were like, oh, yeah, well, we'll have him, too. Like, it's just been around too yeah. long, so we're also having it, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think another thing from the Protestant mindset is that uh, his version of hell is um, very real and visceral mm-hmm. in a way mm-hmm. that, like, appeals to, like, a certain aspect of the Protestant mindset, which is, like, God is going to smite the fuck out of you if you yeah. don't if you don't figure if you don't figure this stuff out and you don't work it out and and get saved and so like when you see this and you see all this punishment and you can feel it and you can smell you know mm-hmm. like the burning flesh and burning hair you know and like you know just these like incredibly like horrific gory punishments and like the protestant mind is like fired by that like oh yeah we can Mm. you you know this this is what we can show you to to like you know to to keep you in line and Mm. you know it's like it's just very evocative of that and yeah i guess it just kind of goes into so like i mean i mentioned the episode of the simpsons but like how does it still affect our view of hell okay so this stuff comes up all the time now where it's Mm -hmm. like basically when you know when people write about hell now they just they've just kind of like accepted dante's topography Mm -hmm. right like and and granted now i'm going to talk about a bunch of comics uh but you know like this Mm -hmm. so for example uh this is really kind of his topography and his way of looking at things is kind of referenced in for example swamp thing uh Mm -hmm. it's certainly referenced in hellblazer um it definitely uh, comes up um, in the Sandman. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, all all of these particularized things happen over and over again. Where you know, like the city of Dis, as mm-hmm. kind of like a you know a place where the the demons live. That's like a really big thing. Oh, Hellboy! That obviously comes yeah. up in Hellboy. Yeah. Um, and you know, the thing of it is, is it's so evocative because it, it kind of like shows us. Um, you you know like this kind of dark mirror image of what the the human world is and and also it's just like really creepy like the forest of suicides man yeah like that it, that's so visceral and yeah. like frightening and and these are these are things that are just kind of everyone is like yeah i'm having that right mm-hmm. it's so useful for us um because oftentimes the way that we we think about things is in a topographical way especially kind of increasingly in in the modern period right like mm-hmm. we like maps you know like in the same way that we everybody freaks out about tolkien's maps it's like well, what if what <laughs> if you can have like a topography of hell and everyone is just like oh shit you know because mm-hmm. you can kind of center all of your stories within that and it's more fun than just kind of like yeah there's a lake of fire Right. Yeah. Like it's a kind of sorting it out so that it's not just like chaos allows mm-hmm. the imagination of those who are kind of reading and those who are writing later to kind of like really expand on these things. So, you know, the gates of hell are very much something that we have kind of taken on. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. And, you know, even now like if we want to talk about how we think a group of people are particularly bad we'll say that they're in a you know there's a circle in hell for them right Mm -hmm. like this this is how much it's kind of like leached into things and that's because it whips 
it whips yes. so hard. Um, and I, it's it's one of these things where I think the first time that I read it, I was like, oh my god, I hadn't really realized that all of this came from here. Yeah, because you just see it everywhere once once you're reading it, you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, like it, uh, you know, uh, the. Um where did you sleep last night? Uh, you know, or yeah. no, I'm sorry. It's, it's not where you, it's a lake of fire. You know, Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lake of fire. Where yeah. do bad folks go when they die? They don't yeah. go to heaven where the angels fly. They go to a lake of fire and fry. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, rip to, I guess rip to Cobain on that one. Yeah. I mean, I guess this is the thing too, right? Is because, um, it's, this isn't to say that like people aren't having hell visions in the medieval period. Like motherfuckers are like tripping out and saying, Oh, I went mm. to hell all the time. But, it isn't regimented in the same way. It's often like, oh, I saw these specific tortures and let me tell mm-hmm. you about these tortures. Like once in a while you'll get, uh, you will get visions that are much more extended and, but they'll kind of be like, oh, and it's sort of like a church. And then if you go into this bit, then there's this. And if you go into this pet, there's more. But I think that what kind of people want hell to be is like a mirror image of heaven kind of um and if you have like a big topography that takes days and days and days to traverse and you know you have all these varying things within it then it allows kind of like the horrors of your imagination to expand into that space whereas Mm -hmm. before like when you get you know all like lots of hell frescoes will show you this or when you get hell visions it's just kind of like yeah you know like you're gonna you will be in the ironic punishments division Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's like a lot of that, but there isn't, there is no kind of a way to really, uh, ex- to explicate it because it is quite chaotic. And mm-hmm. what Dante does is he is able to apply some order to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it just, it just keeps spreading out from there. You know, the movie seven, uh, oh, is yeah, obviously seven. Yep. Mm-hmm. heavily influenced, uh, by, by this, um, you know, uh, you know, it even shows up in like in like video games. Uh, D- the Devil May Cry series uh, mm-hmm. has a lot of uh, tie-ins with uh, the naming and stuff from Dante's Inferno, and uh, you know, it's just uh, it's everywhere. It's really hard. Like, it's really hard to to get mm-hmm. away from it because, like, when you think of hell, like you like you see like you know the re- you see the red background and fires, you know, and uh, you know, mm. even, even, uh, I've seen that, uh, Sallow, uh, Sallow or 120 Days of Sodom, uh, oh, yeah. influenced by it. So, you know, it's like, it's everywhere. It's not, uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's never yeah, gone it's away. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's not, you know, and, and for, and for good reason, right? You know, like if I was going to, uh, write, like, write something and I wanted to talk about hell, I would, I would basically go straight back here. Like, this is just immediately where my brain would go with it, you know? Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I suppose that there are also reasons for that because it also accords really heavily with like classical writings on the land of the dead mm-hmm. as well, you know, yeah. which is, is very much, it looms large in our imaginations, you know, in yeah. kind of like the, the global north. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he, because he's picked up on all these other things that we already know about, it allows us to kind of like go with it, you know, and it's mm. like... Um, you know, it's it's sophisticated and it's easy to kind of grab onto, and I think mm-hmm. at the same time, and that that is what is really difficult to do, right? Yeah. It's often difficult to to come up with something like really complex, but also that people can just go, "Yep, got it. Mm-hmm. I'm coming along with you," right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, you know, I think that um, that does a lot for the cultural influences. Um, I, mm. I don't think we're going to get to uh, any of the cantos uh, before we close up today. Uh, but, you know, before we go, Eleanor, how should we view the work broadly? You know, mm. allegorical, you know, how, how, should, how should modern, you know, modern audiences take this in? I mean, I would say that it's definitely an allegory mm. um, to a certain extent because, you know, again, he's making these things up. Yeah. Right. Um, well, well, I think that th- to a certain extent, what is happening here, and, and we'll see this, one of the reasons we cannot get into the cantos is because it's just like, that's a symbol. That's a yep, symbol. That's a, symbol, that's a yeah. symbol. You know, like every single character and wh- is a symbol. And what kind of symbol? Is, yeah. Yeah. What and, like, what does that it? mean? Like, is it like, what's this coming from? Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got like biblical references. You've got mm-hmm. classical references. So every everything has all of these fucking layers, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Um, I think it has to work as allegory and also it has to work as allegory because that's what medieval people do. 
right? Yeah. Like medieval people write allegories um, and they feel very strongly about that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and for them, you know, a work that doesn't have allegorical meaning is no kind of work at all, essentially. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's certainly there. But I think also part of this is wish fulfillment. Yeah. You know, I think part of this is, is this is what he wants to be true because, you know, he wants his haters to he he's a hater and he wants his haters to have their comeuppance. Right. So there's a part of this, too, which is just like, I hate these guys so fucking much. I want to put them in hell. But also, I think that it's it, it is it's also the equivalent of like, you know, political cartoonists now. Yeah. But being like, this is you and your nose is bigger, you know, like, Mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's like, you know, people drawing, you know, bad Mm -hmm. uh, political, you know, political, like your, your Ben, whatever his guy, Garrison of the world. Yeah. There's a bit of that going on. Um, (laughs) But at the same time, you know, I think that we also do have to understand him as, you know, a Catholic from the 13th century. Yeah. And he believes in hell. Yep. Right. He believes, believes it is a literal place. Yep. He's afraid of it. He uh-huh. can, in his mind's eye, he can see it. He can smell it. He can hear it. Yep. He does not fucking want to go there. Yes. Like above all else, he's like, this place is fucking awful. Yeah. It is horrifying. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think that's one thing that we have to kind of remember because we're like, oh man, this is so cool. Like, yeah. because, because it is right. Mm-hmm. But if you genuinely believe you're going to go there like that, it's scary, right? Like it's oh, fucking yeah. scary. Right. And th- yeah. that, which is part of the reason why we keep using it because it was like, well, my man, my man played a blinder on this one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. The- sometimes, sometimes you just nail it out. You know, you just fucking obliterate it. Yeah, exactly. And so he just fucking knocked it out of the park. It's so fucking scary. And so it works really, really well. So he's frightened of it. It is an allegory, but it's also like, you know, a little bit of, well, I, I really hope my haters are seething right now in a lake yeah. of fire. Like that would be great. Yeah. You know? I s- yeah. I saw a meme. I'll post it on Twitter, but uh, <laughs> it's like Dante and, uh, and he's like holding up. He's like, ha ha. You you know you got me you got me in life but now I've drawn you as the as the nerd and me as the Chad yeah and, you know, exactly like, exactly like, yeah he's like you know not owned absolutely yeah, definitely Don't, not owned tell the tell the press not owned but it's hilarious because like he was incredibly owned in life but yeah. he in his death he won mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not really sure what's better. One of one of the greatest, in, maybe the greatest instance of history not being written by the victors, because he or yeah, because like he lost in life, he lost everything big uh, time. He, yeah, he, you know his, uh, he lost everything. He was kicked out. He you know was miserable for a bunch of much of his life because of all this. But then, oh, you're good. Sorry, everyone. I was calling my cat and I was trying to do it like off because she's just screaming huh. in the other room. But... I could hear that even though you had it, even though you. Ooh, it. who knows? Well, well, guys, yeah. I was screaming cabbage because she is just standing in the other <laughs> room fine. howling. So yeah. now, you know, it'll either be there or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if I find it, I'll take it out. But yeah. Um, yeah. I just think it's so like um, I think it is so humanizing to people in the Middle Ages to like have something like this. You can see this guy and he just has the same like vulnerabilities that we do. He wants he wants his friends and himself mm-hmm. to, to be in power. He wants his enemies taken out like and he is like fucking upset about it. Like he's like, yeah, miserable yeah. about it. And, you know, because, you know, not everything just survives to us from back then mm. you know we don't get that look and so it's nice to have a look of some guy just being like man this shit fucking sucks yeah i fucking hate this shit i yep. like i want to go back to how to where it was like right after we won the battle mm-hmm. and me and my boys were hanging out mm-hmm. and nope never going back man but yep. hey in death you're gonna you're gonna own them all you are easily the most famous Guelph of all time. Oh, that's not absolutely even fucking, close. No, it's nowhere near as Like, basically, one of the only reasons that average people would know the term yes. Guelph is yes. because of Dante. So, uh, <laughs> which is amazing because he hated so hard yeah. that he got, like, an obscure political beef immortalized. So, you know. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Good for him. Uh, just, yeah. 
just great we'll uh we'll get into it uh next month uh we'll go through a few of the first cantos including yes. uh, dante being lost in the woods uh virgil mm-hmm. talking about dante's uh childhood sweetheart who uh Oh, I have so much to say about that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. about Beatrice uh, and how she wasn't his wife. Uh, no. Nope. Who he had kids with. Uh, yep. So, yeah, uh, Beatrice, uh, we'll talk about that next time. We'll talk about the Gates of Hell and Monsters. Uh, yeah. Monsters, all that metal shit. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for subscribing. As I said, next week, uh, we'll be back with uh, something a bit different. Uh, but yeah, enjoy. Uh, for now, enjoy those uh, those nice visions of hell as yes. uh, you sit far away from it, probably not <laughs> believing in it if you're like most people. Yeah. Um, and you could just be like, well, that's metal as hell and not, uh, oh, God, mm-hmm. the burning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Anyway, y'all have a good one. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.